She has a book called The Peace Process. I'm looking forward to hearing what she has to say. Today she does a lot of consulting for people that want to go into business and her credentials of holistic nutrition, sports nutrition, executive coaching, and really helping people thrive in nutrition. How do we take this information and get it out to the world? How do we get it into people's hands? How do we make people successful? Please help me welcome Miriam Zacharias. Good evening. Good evening. Hi guys. <laughs> on the uh, internet of things. <laughs> All right. Tonight I'm going to talk about how to make peace with marketing because that word conjures up a lot of fear with people <laughs> in our industry, right? And we're going to talk about how to create a healthcare practice that thrives in the environment we're living in today. Okay. Now, a question I always like to start with: um, Some of you have already been in business, right? There's some alumni here, and people maybe from different professions. So I'm going to ask you to vote, one way or another, whether or not you think that marketing today is easier or harder than it may have been 10 years ago, okay? And if you don't know, just take a guess. So how many people think marketing a practice is easier? <coughs> okay, quite a few of you. And how many think it's harder? Okay, the answer is it's both. <laughs> it's a trick question. You see, it's easier because, as you know, we have access to things like social media. We can reach more and more people than ever before. It's cheap, or pretty cheap. So we have the access to reach a lot of people, which we didn't have 20 years ago. And there are people out there, people like Mark Hyman, for example, and Oz, Dr. Oz, whatever you think of these people, they are getting out there and talking popular, holistic, ways of thinking about health, right? They're not going the allopathic route. route. They're talking more about holism and integrative medicine and that sort of thing. So that's paving the way. It's making it easier for to have the conversations that we want to have with people. But it's harder because it's easier. There are so many websites for, for people that are competing with you, that when a person goes online to do a search, what do they come up with? Everything from the Nutribullet to a health coach, to a nutritionist, to an acupuncturist, to a blog, a popular blog site. So now all these things are competing, and so it's more difficult to be discovered. So unless you have a booming referral business, you must get good at marketing. When one of my pet peeves, uh, I've worked with a lot of healthcare practitioners uh, as a business coach and an instructor, and one of the things that drives me nuts is when I go onto websites and I see, I do wellness. I have all these great services and this wonderful set of credentials, but people don't buy those things. The average person does not go online and buy credentials or wellness or your services or holism. What do they buy? Does anybody know who Simon Sinek is? Uh -huh. All right. And everybody that raised your hand is smiling big because you, you probably like him as much as I do. <laughs> There's a really great TED Talk. If you've not heard it, I encourage you to listen to it. It's called how great leaders inspire action. And when I heard this talk, it blew me away. It changed everything in my business. And what I learned in that video, that 18 minute video, was that people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And I'm not gonna go into the details of what that means because I do want you to see it. He does it way better than I could. But he shows examples of of Apple Computer, of Martin Luther King, of people who, and organizations 
who were able to build interest in what they were doing and passion around what they were doing simply because the people themselves believe so deeply in their mission, in their purpose. And that's why I have created a marketing methodology where the very first step is purpose. There isn't a marketing book I've ever read in my life that talks about your purpose and your why. It's been pretty much the missing piece. So basically, the peace process is my method for getting your brilliance out into the world so more people can be saved from the, the horrible path we seem to be going down health-wise. And peace is an acronym for five steps. The first step being purpose. Second one is establish. The third is attract. The fourth is connect. And the last step is engage. And what we're going to do here tonight is I'm going to take you through all five steps, sort of a 10,000 foot view, and give you some examples of it so you have an idea of what I'm talking about. And you'll see how it all flows together here. So let's talk about the first step. There was a, a brief introduction about my, my path. And I'd like to go into a little bit more detail because it is my big purpose. And you're looking at a photo of my big brother and I, Eric, um, he's about eight years older than me, and he was my idol, I adored him, I wanted to be just like him, everybody loved Eric. Well, when he was 43 years old, I was working at Microsoft Corporation at the time, and I got a phone call from my dad. He said, honey, you need to come home, your brother has died. Now, I wasn't surprised by his death, but I was really upset. You see, my brother had gone into the hospital with chest pains three years prior to his death. And while he was doing the treadmill test, the doctor said, hey, you need to get bypass surgery tomorrow. So the very next day, 43 years old, Eric went in, got bypass surgery, and the surgeon had been doing back-to-back -back surgeries over the course of that day. So he left the room, and he left the closing to an intern. Well, the intern messed up, and he connected an artery to a vein. Oh. Now, my brother went into immediate cardiac arrest. He survived, but only with 20% of his heart. And they said, you're going to need a new heart to survive long term. So over the next three years, as we waited for the new heart, he kept getting sick. He developed hepatitis, shingles, chronic bouts of pneumonia. He had a hole in his esophagus. We couldn't figure out what was going on. The, the man was being tortured for years. Three years this went on. The month before he died, my brother went into the hospital with a brain tumor an inoperable brain tumor. While they were preparing him for that surgery, however, they did some blood labs. And they discovered that during that botched heart surgery, they also gave him seven units of blood, four of which were tainted with HIV and hepatitis. Well, not long after his death, my mother slid into depression, stopped sleeping, stopped eating, and died. We never knew her again once he died. She just checked out. My other brother, who's in the military, had a break with reality, left the service, was found on the street, he was homeless, and they institutionalized where he remains today. I no longer have contact, nor am I allowed to have contact with him ever again. My father, <laughs> frustrated and in despair, also suffered under the hands of the knife of a heart surgeon and died. So within a very short period of time, I lost my entire immediate family. And the thought of selling one more box of Microsoft software really didn't make a lot of sense. <laughs> so I began digging around at the time, and I discovered this amazing thing, that a healthy diet could prevent heart disease. Now you're going, duh, 
but this was a while ago. <laughs> this was new information to me. So I immediately shifted gears, went back to school to get my degree in holistic nutrition. And I built a thriving business in Southern California. My work at Microsoft was in sales and marketing. So I was very comfortable with promoting myself, self-promotion, building websites, doing all that stuff. But a funny thing happened. All of my really good friends, my new friends in nutrition, in naturopaths, and chiropractors, and health coaches, were struggling in their work. They were closing their doors and going back to their corporate jobs that they really didn't want to go back to. And I asked them why, and they said, well, this whole selling and marketing thing, it's kind of sleazy. I mean, I'm a healer. I don't sell. I'm not in business. And I realized this had to be fixed. <laughs> and I thought, you know, if I take my background of sales and marketing and I can bring it forward to help these healers build businesses that could excel and thrive, I create an army of healers who could help the world. Instead of me one by one helping people with nutrition, wouldn't it be great to build an army? That was my next shift. And you know, when I made that shift, it was the most powerful realization I had about being connected to my purpose. I couldn't think of doing anything else. The reason purpose is so important and why it's so frustrating that so many marketing individuals don't teach it is because it fuels your daily energy. I've seen people that go into this work and they do something that maybe their friends think they should do. Oh, you should go work with people that have this condition or people in this situation because that's your background. Or that's what you dealt with personally. You had that condition. You should go help people with. But what happens is if people don't feel that that's what they want to do and they're meant to do, it drains their energy. By the end of the day, they're beat. Burnout's a big problem in, in our industry. Why? Because we're dealing with a lot of sick people who've been shuttled around and not gotten much help. By the time you come to us, Man, they're just so glad to have someone, but we absorb all that negative energy. By the end of the day, we're like, oh. But if you're doing what you love, you might be tired at the end of the day. You can't wait to get up the next morning, though, and do it all over again. It fuels your energy versus stealing your energy. It anchors your commitment in rough waters. Anybody here have anyone in your life that said, are you crazy? You're going to go do that? <laughs> Imagine what happened when I left Microsoft to go to nutrition. I didn't go over well. <clears throat> we need to feel connected to our purpose and our why. Because it allows us to be strong in the face of all those naysayers. And they're all around us. It also abolishes these issues with distraction and interruption and willpower. Distraction is really bad. We know what's going on out there. I don't have to tell you. Distraction is stealing success right from under our noses. I see it all the time. People just bouncing around all over the place, not getting focused. When you are connected to purpose, you're so deeply embedded to what you're supposed to do that you can push the distraction aside, that it gives you the energy throughout the day. And based on what you'll see with Simon Sinek, it'll make people want to work with you. I don't know, several of you said, boy, I read your story on your website. Wow. Putting your story and your purpose on your website is the most powerful sales tool you have. It's the most powerful sales tool you have, and we don't use it. We talk about our services or our education, and while those things are very important and they have a place in your marketing, it's leading with your purpose that brings people to you. It draws People to you like hummingbirds to nectar. As I said, it's your strategic advantage. And the reason is, is because it's unique. Nobody can copy your story, right? They talk about marketing, one of the most important things is to stand out, to differentiate. You can't get any more different than your story. So where does your story come from, or your purpose come from your story? Right? So 
when I do workshops with people and I talk to them about getting attached to purpose, I have them do a lot of free writing. Because a lot of times people think they know what their purpose is. But I've had people go through a free writing exercise in some of these classes and they start to write, they start to write, pretty soon the tears are flowing, and they say, you know, I thought I came here for a different reason, but it actually wasn't the real purpose and story. So what brought you here? The key thing is to remember the exact moment when you said, okay, that's it, I have gotta go do this, no more. It's time to make the jump. That's the moment that you need to get back to. When did it happen? How have you changed the course of your life? And I always like to encourage people to not just rewrite their story or retell their story, but to relive it, to feel it, to feel the anger, the pain, the emotion, because we get emotionally connected to it, that's when we act. Our emotions are very powerful. All right, the second step of the peace process is establish. I mentioned a little bit earlier that the number of things that are competing for our attention out there is at an all-time high. When you go to put your website up, if you already have your website up, you try to search for yourself and you see it on page 4,728, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. But the number of things are competing is growing day every day. So to stand out means you have to establish yourself as an authority or an expert. And the way you do that is by choosing a niche. Now usually when I get to this point in my, my talks, I start to feel people shake and sweat because <laughs> I wanna help everybody, right? There are a lot of sick people out there. I can't just pick one group. Besides, I'm holistic. Everything's connected to everything. You can't separate the body up, right, into chunks. I know all of your arguments on this one, and you're right. But understand something, niching is a marketing strategy. It's not who you ultimately have to work with, although I'm gonna explain why you should stay focused on your niche, at least in the beginning, but it's a marketing strategy. The reasons it's so important is that it's how people are looking for you. So when people go to look for help for their condition, they go online 95% of the time. That's where they're going. And when they search for you, they don't search for you. They don't look for a general health person who does everything for everybody. <laughs> we don't do that. We don't do that. We look for specific things when we do, do, our, do our searches, right? People are looking for situations they're in. They're tired, they're, they're feeling overweight or anxious, they're achy, or, or maybe they're a busy mom and they just need some help. They're looking for specific things. And if we present ourselves as a generalist that do everything for everyone, they'll never find us. And people want to work with the expert. If I have Hashimoto's disease, I want to go to a health expert who sees Hashimoto's patients day in and day out. She knows all the therapies, the protocols, the supplements. She's heard it all. She knows all the symptoms. That's who I want to go to. I want to work with the person who's best or most well-known in that one area. This is what I was alluding to a little bit earlier. Niching will guide your work and save you time, energy, and money. And especially for those of you who are just starting out, you don't have a lot of any of those things, I'm sure. But when you select a niche, everything lines up. The research that you do is just in that one thing. The protocols that you decide to use in your practice are for that one thing. If you give a talk, the more times you give that talk, the more you research, the more you do this, you become the expert. Because a lot of people say, but I'm not an expert. No, of course not. It's hard to be an expert when you first leave school because you're learning a whole lot of stuff. But especially once you leave, the more you begin to focus, 
The more you begin to use it over and over again, the smarter you get, the better you get, and the more expertise you build. It's a wonderful, beautiful way of working. The marketing you do, this is the most important thing with niching, because from your niche comes your message. I'll be talking about that soon. The message is what attracts people to you. And again, if you're positioning your message and your work as a generalist, who are you going to attract? Even if there are people looking for those generalists, now you're competing with all the other people positioning themselves as generalists, of which most people are doing. And now people are going to go into price war. Oh, who's cheapest? We never want to be in that equation, right? I'm not saying you have to be the high price person, but you don't want people to choose you based on how much you're charging. That's not health, right? I said before, you can still work with whoever you want. Many people have told me who've done niching. Um, I did a summit, a couple of summits in the last few years with a lot of very successful practitioners. And they said they always started with a niche because the niche market they worked with kept referring people in. Oh, do you also work with these people? Oh, yeah, yeah, send them all in. Right, so you work my, my spouse has this problem. I don't think, yeah, yeah, send them in. So you can still work with whoever you want. Just remember that when you start to bring in all those other people, you're going to be spending your weekend or evenings researching all those other conditions. So keep that in mind. But you can still serve who you want. Niching is a marketing strategy that's being discovered. So how do we get to your niche? Well, there are two ways to think about niching. The first is what we usually think about, which is a condition or a disease. People that might have heart disease, Lyme disease, or an autoimmune condition. Those are pretty clear-cut niches. But there are other ways of thinking about a niche. People in a particular circumstance. So, busy moms who need fast, healthy recipes. Athletes who want to build lean muscle. Young couples who want help to conceive. Those are also niches. So it doesn't always have to be a disease or condition. Okay, so here's the equation. I help X to Y so that Z. This is how I guide people to figure out who their niche is. X is who you help, Y is what you help them do, and Z are the top results or transformational results that they're going to get by working with you. I'm going to show you some examples here. I help women over 40 to balance their hormones so they can feel confident, sexy, and vibrant again. See the second part of this equation, so that they can, these words are the words that you use in all of your marketing because that's what a woman over 40 wants. I don't know of any woman over 40 that runs around saying, I really want to balance my hormones. <laughs> they don't. I want to sleep. I want to lose this extra weight. I want to feel sexy again. I feel old. Those are the words they use, that's what they're searching for, that's what they'll resonate with when they go to your website and you're using that same language. Okay, this is why this is so important to get that idea of your niche. I help people suffering from allergy symptoms to clean up their diet and environment so they can feel great and live symptom free. Okay, another niche. Now this next one is one of my favorites because in a workshop I was doing, a naturopathic physician said she refused to pick a niche. I said, okay. I said, well, just do me a favor. Go through the exercise anyway. Think about who you really would like to help. And she didn't realize it, but she came up with a niche. I help people who are concerned about getting a disease. That's a niche, right? You can put that on a website. You can talk about that in articles. It's a deep fear that people have because it runs in the family to take control of their health so that they feel empowered, beat the odds, and live radiantly. I love that. Now, of course, who is this patient? Cancer, heart disease, autoimmune, everything. And I told her, I said, that's fine. Understand you're gonna have to know about a lot of things. And actually, if you think about it, is it even possible to know about every condition, every disease, for every man, woman, and child on the planet. 
And every protocol and supplement and herb and everything else we need to take care of them, no. So don't put that on yourself. Think about health niching can be a more powerful way. But it was a, a fascinating way of niching because the messaging in her statement allows her now to talk about helping people with a, a very common fear that many of us have. All right. The third step is attract. And I suggested earlier that attracting people is comes from the messages that you put out. So we know what we're about. We have an idea of who we want to work with. Now we need to figure out what message we need to put in our marketing to bring them in, to make them want to work with us. So your marketing message is what grabs your prospect's attention and tells them you understand their problem, you can help them, and why you're the best choice over all the other solutions they might choose. This is the basic structure right here of your website homepage. That's all you have to put on your homepage. You don't have to put your mission or your story or your anything. The homepage, which is where most people land, they want to know about how are you going to help me? Okay? Tell me what you're going to do for me. That's what they care about. Because the average person spends 2.9 seconds on a website before they decide whether to stay or go. 2.9 seconds. What does that mean? That means that if you sit there on your homepage and talk about yourself, boom, they're gone. They really care about what's going on with them, all right? So the message you put to attract them should elicit an I need your help or that's for me. She's exactly what I want, okay? That's what you're looking for with messaging. Whether it's your website, your brochure, your social media, your blog, your book, whatever the thing is, however you choose to market, and by the way, I suggest you pick just one or two ways, not all of those ways. Okay, remember, focus. <laughs> you have a very brief moment in time to capture their attention, okay? So I'm gonna give you some samples, a couple of websites that I liked a lot, and I'll talk you through why I like the messages on them. Amanda Brimhall is a naturopathic physician, and um, she had a pretty generic website before she and I began to work together several years ago, um, where she had listed all the conditions she worked with. It was like you know a whole web page, <laughs> and I said, "Well, we really, what really speaks to you?" And she said, "I just love working with with women who are you know have hormonal issues." And if you look at her, her language, are you sick of feeling fat, tired, and forgetful? Now, a lot of us would feel terrified to put that on a website, <laughs> right? We go, ooh, but you know what? It's working because she's answering the questions in their head. She's going right into what they're thinking about, what they're worried about, where their big fears are. Um, take my quiz to find out. Now, her quiz is a way to capture names, uh, which is a, an important strategy. It's not critical, but it's a very important one, and I'll talk about that in a minute, too, um, in order to continue the ongoing conversation with people who kind of like what she's about, okay? Feel good again. They just, she, it just made you feel, you look at it and you go, that makes me feel good. Or maybe if you're not her target market, some of you guys might go, I don't think so, but um, you, those who resonate will go to her, and that's what she wants. She's not trying to get everybody just the people that resonate with her. Evelyn Lambrecht is a health coach, and I really just love this website because it's very, very clear. Elevate your energy, where women find the energy to do great things. Nice tagline, right? You know exactly what she's about. <laughs> women who need energy. Now, that could be a big group of women, but, um, but that is her focus. 
She also has a free guide, which I love the title as well, Five Ways or Five Days to More Energy for the Life You Want. Ridiculously simple and free. Okay? Some people in our industry feel that these name captures are sleazy. It's like, ooh, I hate it when people ask me for my name all the time. That's okay, you're not their ideal person, but I'm guessing you have put your name in places that you do resonate with, right? So you're only trying to find the ones who resonate with you. It's not, a, it's not about you, it's about the people who are gonna resonate with you. So don't be afraid to, to use this. It's still a very successful tool for collecting names, all right? Which brings us to connect. And the connection piece of that is building no like, and trust. You've probably heard those terms before when it comes to marketing. Most important thing we do is, is, well, think about yourself. We work with people we know, like, and trust. We buy from people we know, <coughs> like, and trust. Sometimes we don't, and then we're frustrated. But if we, in fact, if you look at even some of the um, statistics with doctors, that people, if they like their doctor, even if they mess them up in some way, they won't sue them because they like them. So it's pretty fascinating stuff. So the no like, and trust factor is very, very important. And the reason is, like that 2.9 second stat, this is my other favorite stat. It takes up to 16 exposures to you before someone decides to buy something from you. That means they need to either see your name somewhere, heard you speak, heard somebody say your name. So some exposure to you. Now, not everyone. Some people be ready right away. Um, I think Tony Robbins is the one that came up with 16. I have read six, but it's growing because there's so many people we can't trust out there. And so we're now even more gun shy. So people need to feel like they know you and are comfortable with you. And that's why if you think you're gonna put up a website and people are gonna go there and then come in to see you, it's not gonna happen, and that's okay. It's, it's something to just be aware of. So since it takes up to 16 exposures to you, um, the most important thing you could do is build a list of prospective clients and existing clients so you can start a conversation with them through email marketing, blogging, and other ways. So they get to know you, so they begin to trust you. So they go, well, she really does know her stuff when it comes to this particular situation. If you want to launch a new program in your clinic, announce a new therapy, invite people to a workshop you want to conduct, offer specials, educate, build relationship, how are you going to do that if you don't have any names? Right? A lot of people say, boy, I want to do workshops, but who do I invite? Well, <laughs> You know, you can put an ad in a newspaper somewhere and you can talk to some friends, but the most important thing you can do is to begin to collect these names either on your website, like some of those things that I've showed you, or if you give talks, or uh, there are other ways. If you have a blog, people can subscribe to a blog or even social media, although we're going to talk about social media in a second. Oh, so here's the slide. These are the ways you, you can begin to establish connections. Networking is a, these two right here, networking and public talks, are probably the fastest way to get new business. So if you're just starting out, or even if you've been in business a little while and it's slow, networking and public talks are the fastest way to get new business. Because a lot of people think it's social media. And is it? It's not. And the reason is, you know, there are a lot of benefits. You don't need a lot of technical skill. You can reach a lot of new people really fast. It doesn't cost a lot of money. It can support other work you're doing. Uh, it's mostly free or cheap. But there's a big downside to social media. First of all, you have no ownership of the platform. We don't have to talk about Facebook now, but we all know. You don't own the information on Facebook. So you don't even know if what you might post is gonna show up in people's news feeds because the algorithms in social media are getting more and more complex. 
if people aren't engaging with you regularly on social media, they, you don't, you're invisible. You don't even come up on a news feed, okay? So there's some crazy algorithms. I never want to trust the ownership of my marketing to somebody else, right? Um, and we really, selling on social media, ugh, you know it yourself. I don't know about you, but when I see people selling to me, constantly selling on social media, no, not interested. Social media, social media. The word social means community. When you build your list through other means, sure, build your social community on whatever social media platform you want, but use it as a way to connect, to build tribe, to share, but not to sell. You can sell a little bit, but it doesn't really play very well in social media. All right. Final step, engage. So up until now, we've been talking about a marketing strategy. And these steps are in sequence. You first, before you go out to do any marketing at all, you need to do these two things. Then those two things. But the engage step is something different. The engage step is the sales, selling part of your work. And that means all these names and all these fans and all this conversation you're having. The engage step is when you convert them from prospect to customer, to paying customer. So that's where we do the selling. And if you've been doing this really well, these first four steps, the last step is pretty easy, right? Because they're already warmed up. <laughs> they already know I can trust you. They've been following you for a while. Chances are they've called you because they've already seen you a number of times and they feel good about you. So the engage step is a lot easier at this point than like going in cold where they've never heard of you before. So I have another process for selling called PACE. And um, the reason I called it that is a lot of people rush through selling. They get nervous, you know, you're in that situation and somebody's asking you about your prices and everything else and we kind of get up, kind of frantic and we kind of speed through the sell, selling process. And that's why I say to pace yourself. And that also is an acronym for presence, ask, clarify, and enroll. So let me go through those steps real quickly with you. Presence means get in the moment. Now we don't always have an opportunity to do that. If somebody's calling on the phone, and wants to engage with us. Sometimes we don't have the opportunity, but remove the distractions, turn off your email system, shut down your computer if you can, get into beginner's mind, empty it, try not to have any preconceived mo um, notion, don't get too attached to it, just let it be, and reserve time and space for that person who's hurting. They're the most important person in the equation at this point, not you. The second question your pros at, ask. What's going on? How long has it been going on? What have you tried? What's worked? What makes it worse, right? We know all those questions. That's the second part of the step. This third part is where we often go wrong. And it's probably the most powerful step. In fact, I went to a new chiropractor yesterday and he did this. I was like, I just want to take a, a video of him doing it. He did it so well. <laughs> This is where you say, this Hashimoto's you have, how is it impacting your ability to enjoy your family life? What are you unable to do today that you'd like to do again? It's digging deep and asking them how it's impacting their life and the people around them. How is this affecting your relationships? When people be, because a lot of times we're so self-focused when we're not well, we don't think about anything else. But when you get them to think about the bigger picture of what's going on in their life, and they go, wow, I better take care of this. I didn't realize that this thing is, has a ripple effect throughout my life. So the clarify step is asking them how their problem is impacting other aspects of their life and relationships. And then you enroll them. 
And the enrolled step is simply repeating what they told you they want. This is, again, where many people decided, like, you know, they roll out the whole list of services. Oh, we can do this, and we can do that, we can do this other thing, and blah, 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 blah. Forget about all that. Just talk about what they said they want, <laughs> right? You said you had these things. Here's what we can do for those things, and that's all. We know you can do all kinds of stuff, and you might be able to use all those other things then, too. But for now, they only care about the one thing they asked for. Address any objections that they have, and then offer your services. What are the objections? Price, impatience, change, and trust. These are always kind of the big things that stand in the way of people moving forward with us. Um, I'm not gonna go into those, because I don't have time. Um, but I do, uh, there are some copies of my book in the bookstore. And I actually address each one of these in that book. Here's how you counter the issue of price. Here's what you say to that person, okay? Those are the things that you're gonna face. And my bottom line with, with anything when it comes to selling is, if it's not hell yes, it's no. If people are jumping up and down, excited to work with me, say, yeah, let's do this, I'm not sure I wanna move forward with them. If they're hesitant, what kind of patient or client are they going to be? If they're fearful or mistrusting, will they actually follow through? And if they don't follow through, then what happens? They won't have success. Does anybody want that? So the key is let them go. If they're not, if they're all on the fence and they got to think about it, say, you know what? It sounds like this might not be the right thing for you right now. They may be back. No just might mean not now. So don't be attached to the outcome of yes. Leave space and room for somebody else to work with you. That's the peace process. And um, I have written a book on it. Uh, I have some limited copies in the bookstore. I uh, should sell them in there tonight. Um, and it'll take you much deeper into all of the things that I just talked about. Um, and that is it. Peace process, limited copies up in the bookstore.